Robert Smith is the richest African American, but for some reason, no one really knows about him. We're all familiar with the likes of Oprah, Michael Jordan, Rihanna, and Jay-Z, but Robert Smith didn't build his wealth in sports or entertainment. He's the founder of Vista Equity Partners, one of the world's leading private equity firms. Vista invests exclusively in software, data, and tech-enabled businesses. Whether you're a B2B SaaS business in Silicon Valley, a data analytics firm in New York, or a fintech startup in Stockholm, Vista Equity is probably keeping a close eye on you. The company manages 96 $6 billion in assets, has completed more than 590 private equity transactions, and made Robert Smith a billionaire many times over. Behind this legendary private equity firm is the incredible story of a young man who just wanted to become an engineer, but who instead ended up competing with the biggest financiers on Wall Street. Robert was born in Denver, Colorado in 1962 as the civil rights movement spread across America. Growing up in a predominantly African-American neighborhood, he was exposed to the realities of racial inequality and segregation at an early age. He attended a blacks-only school until age 11 when something unexpected happened that would change the trajectory of his life. In 1973, Denver public schools were ordered to desegregate classrooms and implement mandatory busing. Kids in Robert's neighborhood were now forced to attend different schools across town, but only some kids made it. Right before this was to happen, some racists didn't think this was a good idea and burned like a third of the buses. Okay, so now, all of a sudden, Fewer people are going to get bust, just as we nature. So rather than my whole neighborhood getting bust, only one bus came to my neighborhood. And so it just so happened to hit on a, on a corner down the block from me. And when I look at the kids who were on that bus versus the kids who were two blocks away, it was those kids have a higher percentage of professionals, went to Ivy League schools, became you know, doctors and professors and scientists. Robert's parents were both school teachers and played a key role in shaping his love for learning. They also taught him to never take no for an answer. When Robert was just 15 years old, he landed a summer internship at Bell Labs, a research and scientific development company where the C programming language and the Unix operating system were both created. Landing the internship was a big deal. It was meant for college students who had already wrapped up their junior year and Robert was still in high school. He called the company every Monday for five months begging for a shot, but kept being rejected. When a student from MIT didn't show up, Robert was offered the position and that summer he developed a reliability test for semiconductors. Most kids his age wouldn't understand the significance of such complex tests, let alone what semiconductors even are, but Robert was different. While his peers were playing sports or chasing girls, Robert was learning everything he could about high-tech companies and the latest trends in engineering. Robert's mentor at Bell Labs was a chemical engineer who explained that chemical engineers were like modern-day alchemists. They would take one form of matter and transform it into another. Sand would become silicone, and oil would become plastic. This inspired Robert to pursue chemical engineering at Cornell while continuing to work at Bell Labs during his college breaks. After graduation in 1985, Robert managed to land engineering jobs at some of the most reputable companies at the time, including Goodyear, Air Products, and Kraft General Foods. He clearly wanted to make an impact and won four patents focused on coffee machine technology. As an engineer, he learned the importance of developing consistent processes. It's not enough to just build something once. You've got to develop and deliver a consistent product over several years, often decades. This is just as true for processed goods like tires and cream cheese as it is for enterprise software. But one of Robert's biggest lessons would dawn on him when he discovered a way to save Kraft General Foods millions of dollars. Robert was responsible for improving the company's best-selling coffee product, Maxwell House. The goal was to enhance the coffee's flavor while at the same time reducing its cost of production. By using his alchemist skill set, Robert managed to reduce the cost of production by 14 cents per pound of coffee, and the company was manufacturing millions of pounds of coffee per month. Robert's findings helped generate close to $12 million in savings for the company per year. What did Robert get in return? Well, he received a generous $1,000 bonus, an award, and a plaque. It taught him the importance of owning a bigger chunk of the upside and the value of capital over labor. He writes, While inventing things was a great way of life, capital and utilization of capital can actually be much more effective. While working at a Goodyear plant in upstate New York, Robert stumbled upon a magazine called Black Enterprise. The cover of the magazine featured several African Americans who were working on Wall Street. Robert had no clue what Wall Street was at the time, but the stories of these successful individuals, who were all kings of capital, inspired him to consider a career change. This newfound inspiration led Robert to Columbia Business School, located just a short subway ride from the world's financial epicenter. While at Columbia, Robert 
Robert attended a keynote presentation which, lo and behold, happened to be held by one of the guys he had seen on the cover of Black Enterprise, a banker named John Nudendahl. That's the power of putting yourself in the right rooms. Robert introduced himself to John and the two decided to grab lunch. During lunch, Robert explained what he had worked on previously and the things he had invented. John was impressed by the young engineer's background and encouraged him to pursue a career in investment banking. John even offered to call up all his connections at Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Bankers Trust and JP Morgan to get interviews lined up for Robert. Now, while banking was quite different from his engineering background, Robert became absolutely fascinated with M&A. He said, wow, the business that I really like is mergers and acquisitions, okay? Because if you think about M&A, it's board level discussions, it's CEO level discussions, and it's how assets move across this planet. And this is another one of those life lessons. This is something you don't learn in school. It's an apprenticeship business. You can read all the books in the world, but you actually have to practice it, okay? You actually have to develop a set of skills that have to be honed through a set of interactions that create fact patterns that you can rely on to make judgments going forward. Robert realized that he would get the best training at Goldman and decided to join the firm after graduating B school in 1994. Many MBA associates struggled to add value as bankers, but Robert was different. During his six years at Goldman, he catapulted himself to the role as co-head of enterprise system and storage, helping manage M&A transactions for companies like Apple, Texas Instruments, HP, Yahoo, and eBay. Robert was one of Goldman's first tech M&A bankers and helped set up their San Francisco office during a time when software solutions were just started to be introduced in the business environment. This gave Robert a serious edge. He was at the forefront of the fourth industrial revolution and witnessed trends in the software industry before many others. He realized that software was becoming a critical part of every business and that companies that effectively leveraged software were able to significantly boost productivity and operational efficiency. Robert's unique engineering and finance blend allowed him to understand the tech infrastructure, the business model that drove its profitability, and the financial implications of strategic decisions. His charisma also made him a master of building strong relationships. I mean, who wouldn't want to follow this teddy bear-like guy to the edge of the world? Remember how Robert's mentor at Bell Labs referred to chemical engineers as the modern-day alchemists? Well, there was now a new alchemist in town, the software engineer. Code was the new raw material and intellectual property was the new form of gold. And Robert was ready to risk it all on this new breed of innovator. In 2000, at age 38, Robert resigned from Goldman Sachs and launched Vista Equity Partners, a first of its kind private equity firm with a goal to solely invest in B2B software companies. You see, PE firms acquire cash generating assets using large portions of debt. But at the time, software was still a new phenomenon and few financial institutions were willing to use intangible assets like software as collateral for loans. Robert eventually convinced banks to lend to Vista anyway by arguing that subscription-based businesses can tolerate debt. This presented a unique opportunity for Vista. Robert and his team could chase software companies exclusively while competitors like TPG and KKR were busy outbidding each other over deals in industries such as media and consumer retail. So what was it about software companies specifically that convinced Robert to ditch his high-flying gig at Goldman? To put things in perspective, on average, a Vista-owned enterprise software company generates a 600% ROI for its customers. Few investments in the world can match up to those numbers. Enterprise software is incredibly sticky. Once large corporations like Uber and Target have implemented iSIM's HR and recruiting software into their daily workflow, they're unlikely to switch to a competitor. The effort required to switch and the costs associated with training an entire organization on a new software solution is simply too high. Not only does enterprise software come with recurring revenue and high gross margins, their solutions are also business critical. Robert Smith summarized it eloquently in the following quote. Software contracts are better than first lien debt. You realize a company will not pay the interest payment of their first lien until after they pay their software maintenance or subscription fee. We get paid our money first. Who has a better credit? He can't run his business without our software. All of this makes for spectacular risk-adjusted returns, especially if the acquired software companies can be improved over time and the process can be consistently replicated at scale. As we explored, Robert learned how to create repeatable processes as an engineer, and he built Vista on the same philosophy, distilling his approach in a 110-point playbook. This playbook is a heavily guarded secret stored on a company server that makes a record every time someone downloads it.
Sound intense? Well, it's an operating manual that has helped Vista generate annual realized returns of 30% since inception. But the story of Vista's early days wasn't straightforward. Sure, Robert had an impressive background and a compelling investment philosophy, but he was still pretty much a nobody. This is something he realized while trying to raise capital from international pension funds and sovereign wealth funds. And it would teach him a lesson that is worth paying extremely close attention to. No substitute for becoming an expert and being the best at your craft. And that's what I focused on. And I focused on that. And as we started as a Vista, you know, first as an investment, first as an engineer, then an investment banker, and then uh, in starting Vista. But I realized that I was going to be limited by the amount of capital if people didn't know who I was. To give you an example of what my experience was like 10 years ago, you know, I'd go to the Middle East and I'm, you know, I'd bring my little prequin studies, you know, top private equity investor, best returns, low, zero loss ratio, all those happy stuff. And I sit there in the waiting room hoping that they call me in. After I've flown, uh, it was not Vista Air at that time, to get to, you know, Dubai or, or Kuwait or, or, or Hong Kong or Sing Singapore, wherever. And I'd get pulled in and, well, this person can't make the meeting and I end up with some low-level low person and I'm giving the pitch and the whole thing and nothing happens. It's not enough for you to become an expert at your craft. You also need to make sure that others know that you're an expert. Only then will they seek you out and create opportunities for you. That's the value of a personal brand. It essentially gives you a personal monopoly. So what did Robert do? He hired a strategic PR firm that helped him get his name in important publications that he knew LPs were reading. Today, Vista has no problem raising capital and its funds are always substantially oversubscribed, often by more than 4x. Since 2000, Vista has acquired majority stakes in businesses such as cybersecurity firm Critical Start and the booking platform MindBody. Vista also holds minority positions in giants like Klarna. Why do founders decide to sell to Vista specifically? Because they know that Vista provides more than just capital. A portfolio company typically has an operating margin of 20% when Vista acquires it. Once Vista's best practices are implemented, such as moving parts of the company to a less expensive city and improving product development, the Port Coast operating margins are doubled within four to five years. Vista also brings its portfolio companies, CEOs and CTOs together to share experiences and ideas. They even have their own in-house consulting firm called Vista Consulting Group, which helps portfolio companies with training and testing. Robert Smith has clearly built an elite private equity shop where every detail has been meticulously designed, but his impact goes beyond the private equity industry. He's a champion for diversity in both finance and tech and has made significant contributions to promote opportunities for underrepresented groups. In 2019, during a commencement speech at Morehouse College, Robert announced that he would pay off all student loans for the entire graduating class, a gift worth $34 million. He's joined Warren Buffett and Bill Gates in signing the Giving Pledge, and it's becoming increasingly clear that this chemical engineer is the alchemist of Wall Street, transforming intellectual and financial capital into equal opportunity.